couple of times. So give us five minutes for our startup time. At that time, just for the purposes of logistics for this evening, um, I'm going to have the administration uh, represented by David Jones, Liz Hirsch, Joanne Otero Cruz, Tumar Alexander, Noel Foison, and uh, Cynthia Figueroa provide for the purposes of the record, because this is an official council hearing, um, an update of uh, project resilience and the new allocation uh, recently approved in council. Uh, then we will have two of our community partners, Reagan Kelly from NET and Dr. Cheryl Pope from APM. And then we really want to open it up to some of the community voices and among some of the people that I have uh, testifying is Sterling Johnson, David Garrick, um, Ro Rosalinda Lopez, Ramon Cruz, Elijah Desimore, and Adrian Rivera Reyes. If anyone else is interested in testifying, please let this young gentleman know. Um, we'll have you. I'm going to ask people to be respectful, and if you are a provider or someone if someone else, uh, we want, really want to create time and a space for community residents to speak. So we will officially start in five minutes. Thank you all. Uh, for the record, the chair of this committee, Councilman uh, Cindy Bass, uh, has a show for her daughter, and she is a mommy, and that is extremely important. And so we are going to excuse her today. I am vice chair, and I think I can handle it. Um, so shout out to mothers who go to Christmas plays, right? Uh, that's usually important. Having established, though, the Committee on Public Health and Human Services, uh, having established the quorum to my right is Councilwoman Blondell Reynolds Brown. And I also want to excuse her because she had a prior commitment. Many of you know we changed the dates two or three times, so my apologies, and we wanted to get it in before the end of the year and before the holidays, so we will excuse her at the appropriate time so she can complete her duties. To my left, Councilman Greenlee, Bill Greenlee, and to his left, Councilwoman Helen Gim. So for the record, uh, uh, I'm gonna have the uh, clerk read the title of the bill. Resolution 180037, a resolution authorizing the Committee on Public Health and Human Services to hold hearings to assess the City of Philadelphia's efforts as coordinated by the Managing Director's Office and our Human Services Department to prevent and treat abuse, addiction, and disease related to the use of opioids. Thank you. Just for um, purposes of bringing people up to date as to where we've been, this resolution was introduced on January 25th, 2018. That's right, 11 months uh, since we uh, started this process. In April 4th at uh, Visitation Center, we had a similar community meeting and discussion both with the administration and members of the community. On March 12th in City Hall, we had a public hearing to speak about the bigger portfolios and human service providers and the city departments and their response. And now we're here at McPherson Library. So there's been a series of meetings. All of the testimony related to those hearings are public record. You can get it on the city council uh, legislar or you can contact our office and we're happy to share uh, with you uh, the transcripts. We have an official stenographer. This will be taped for purposes of public access uh, TV, government public access TV. Um, do any of my colleagues have a comment before we begin? Okay. I want to acknowledge there are many people in the room. I thought I saw Representative Holstein here. Is he here? Joe? Joe, thank you so very much for coming and congratulations. I uh, look forward to another partner in this work. Um, Donna Allman, who is the leader of the 33rd Ward, uh, which we are in uh, in her ward, and many of you, who some of you who will be testifying, we will introduce as we begin. Um, I'm going to ask the administration to come in first, and then um, we'll ask a couple of questions, and I do want to get to the community. We are going to ask community members to, um, for, especially for those who did not submit written testimony, to do the testimony within three and five minutes. I promise I am going to get everybody out of here um, in 90 minutes. And, I, and I'm gonna stick to it. I'm a stickler for that stuff. We're gonna get out of here in 90 minutes. So, uh, what's that? Uh, seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. We started 15 minutes late, so we'll allow that grace period, but you know how we can be. So, I wanna be clear. 
So first of all, uh, many of you have participated in one way or another, either in the Kensington Civics Group or as part of the emergency declaration made by the mayor that folks will speak to. And, uh, and when we have Tumar Alexander and uh, Joanna Alberto Cruz, they can speak a little bit to that. But before that, we started a conversation around a systematic reform for treatment and services in our Department of Behavioral Health. So I'm gonna ask David Jones, who is the director of our Department of Behavioral Health to come forward and Liz Hirsch to specifically address some of the um, reforms that uh, the system has accepted part of the recommendations in the initial hearing that we had in March, but really a lot of the input from hearing from the folks, both in the community and in addiction. So I'm gonna have them first speak to um, the uh, entry access to treatment and the bigger picture that we're doing. And then uh, we will have Tumar Alexander who, uh, I hope he didn't volunteer because if he did, he's crazy who has been leading our project <laughs> resilience uh, project and he can speak specifically to the emergency declaration and some of the work that has been done in the community. So with that. So although the uh, chairwoman isn't here as indicated, good evening, uh, chairwoman Cindy Bass, uh, chairwoman Maria Quiona Sanchez and other council members on the Committee of Public Health and Human Services. I am David T. Jung, commissioner of the Department of Behavioral Health Intellectual Disability Services, DBHIDS. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify in response to resolution number 180037. DBHIDS is responsible for oversight of a provider network that serves children, youth, adults, and families in Philadelphia with behavioral health challenges and or intellectual disabilities. Today's testimony will focus on the DBHIDS response to the opioid epidemic and reforms and barriers of um, accessing substance use disorder treatment, much of this work is centered between the divisions of behavioral health and community behavioral health, uh, CBH, which is a city governed <laughs> nonprofit managed care entity that serves as a payer for behavioral health services for individuals um, eligible for public health or Medicaid. The Division of Behavioral Health serves as a payer for individuals without insurance. Um, our work touches many lives. Both uh, national and Philadelphia data indicates that one in five people experienced some form of mental illness or substance use disorder. In calendar year 2017, over 700,000 Philadelphians were eligible for Medicaid via community behavioral health. During that same year, over 120,000 people participated in treatment between DBH and CDH, representing approximately 21% consistent in the national rates of behavioral health services utilization. I will underscore the point that ensuring that individuals who have opioid use disorder have access to treatment is among our highest priorities as a department. We're equally committed to helping community members feel supported in their neighborhood. We are working um, and we're making progress. In calendar year 2017, at CBH, more than 32,000 um, individuals utilized substance use disorder treatment services. More than 15,000 of whom were treated for opioid use disorder. This demonstrates an increase of 6,500 individuals who utilize substance use disorder services and 1,500 individuals who were treated for opioid use disorder in calendar year 2016. To give you a sense of the size of our network, CBH contracts with more than 175 separate clinical programs, service locations to treat persons with substance use disorder and mental illness. These contracted entities comprise over 2,000 beds, including inpatient hospital programs, residential programs for rehabilitation, detoxification, and halfway houses. In addition to the bed-based services, CBH also offers member services of varying levels of intensity within an ambulatory and community-based settings. These services include outpatient, intensive outpatient, partial hospitalization, and services designed to keep recipients in community settings such as case management and payer management services. In our efforts to address the uh, epidemic, uh, certainly they centered around making sure that treatment is accessible and making sure that treatment is high, uh, high quality um, and effective. In the area of opioid use disorder, the most effective treatment is medication assisted treatment, uh, MAT. MAT is the use of medications such as methadone, buprenorphine, or suboxone and Vivitrol in combination with counseling and behavioral therapies. 
Research has demonstrated uh, a 75% reduction in mortality in patients treated with buprenorphine versus people treated with psychosocial interventions alone. Therefore, much of our work is focused on increasing the availability uh, and use of MAT in all Philadelphia in terms of each level of care. Despite the overwhelming evidence of the efficacy of MAT, uh, currently 65% of our uh, SUD providers offer a form of MAT, and we will continue to work diligently uh, to have our whole network uh, reach 100% uh, in terms of being able to offer MAT. Um, given the efficacy, again, of MAT, we launched uh, next 24-hour, seven-day access point, which has been accepting members uh, with a full range of SUD and which, uh, withdrawal symptoms for assessment, stabilization, um, and referral to the appropriate level of care, also using warm handoffs. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about that from Regan in just a bit. Uh, Temple Episcopal's Crisis Response Center um, has been enhanced with hiring dedicated staff to engage, um, access, assess, and treat individuals with opioid use disorder. Again, I think you may hear more from Dr. O'Gurk about that. Um, MAT, uh, we've expanded uh, capacity by 3,000 slots uh, in during uh, 2018. Um, CDH issued uh, three bulletins to its provider network to increase education, individual choice, and the availability of MAT. Um, this includes um, short and long-term residential uh, substance use disorder rehabilitation and halfway houses to provide um, MAT compatible services. Um, all SUD providers incorporate, again, uh, medication-assisted treatment options into planning, um, treatment planning, um, and then that there's informed consent as a part of that process, and that all providers uh, to make MAT available uh, by 2020. To further increase access, um, we've also worked with the provider network to decrease the time of induction, that is the time that people are actually placed on a medication-assisted treatment, to expand night and weekend hours, and to coordinate linkages um, after an individual is discharged from one level of care to another. Regarding barriers, uh, we've actually worked to remove uh, managed care requirements, uh, for example, uh, drug screens um, and vital signs. Uh, that's kind of, it's been kind of a sequential, historically it was a uh, sequential step set of which getting the drug screen was the first part. And what we said is move into treatment and we can kind of get that as it goes. Um, we've expanded the flexibility of ID utilization, uh, particularly for uh, opioid treatment uh, programs, and then we've um, ended prior authorization requirements for short-term substance use disorder treatment. Um, we realize that there's more work and change uh, is still needed. We're committed to addressing the barriers that remain um, and to capitalize on opportunities to increase access to treatment across multiple settings. Uh, we've actually also offered several training opportunities to improve um, access um, and quality of SUD treatment. Uh, we've launched a monthly um, medication-assisted treatment uh, learning collaborative. Uh, we've also, uh, DBHIDS has held 26 two-day American Society of Addiction Medicine um, trainings, which uh, essentially um, help uh, clinicians completing assessment uh, for substance use disorder, determine essentially medical necessity and level of care. Um, we've worked uh, with all of the recovery houses um, on training focused on MAT, and we continue to have those trainings open to all recovery house uh, staff. Uh, and then there's also, uh, we've provided buprenorphine waiver trainings to 183 Philadelphia prescribers. Um, we've also, uh, we're increasing access by bringing engagement resources to in uh, individuals uh, that includes CBH member services along with uh, two certified peer specialists, uh, one of which is here tonight, um, that work um, at the Mural Arts Storefront uh, here in Kensington. Um, the mobile engagement unit via our relationship with Prevention Point is offering MAT inductions here in Kensington. The mobile outreach program via Merikey is engaging individuals on a daily basis, um, utilizing um, innovation, innovative approaches. Uh, like um, uh, Uber Health, as an example. Um, we also have uh, convened a network of behavioral health providers in Kensington to facilitate warm handoffs and foster referral relationships, particularly between kind of the mental health and then historic substance use providers. Um, and then we are certainly working very closely uh, with Liz Hirsch, Office of Homeless Services, 
um, including deploying additional outreach teams to help individuals experiencing homelessness. Um, multiple additional resources have been uh, provided, um, including the mobile engagement teams, and we have worked with, um, again, our provider network that, can, that includes, in this case, PHMC, NET, Cadenzia, Marikey, Wedge, Pathways to Housing, One Day at a Time, uh, Peers from Journey of Hope, our project, our uh, consumer satisfaction team, Clean Slate, and again, I had mentioned um, Prevention Point. There are over 70 um, in-network behavioral health program locations in Kensington. These programs provide a wide variety of services to children, um, adolescents, adults, and include federally qualified health centers, mental health outpatient programs, substance use outpatient programs, intensive outpatient programs, um, res rehab, uh, halfway houses, and acute inpatient psychiatric programs, along with uh, children's partial programs. Um, we are um, uh, excited about uh, what that uh, continuum includes. And what I'll do is actually, um, I'll stop there. Um, we certainly have provided an overview of the department's response to the opioid epidemic and our treatment continuum. And uh, we'll continue to focus on reforms and barriers of accessing substance use disorder treatment, I'm appreciative of the opportunity uh, to testify this evening, and if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Before we go to Liz, and unfortunately we only have one microphone, I hope you can hear me. Okay. Um, you, you spoke to 70 locations in Kensington. As you know, some of the concerns with the, the community and long-term residents of Kensington is the locating of all of these centers. Is there, I know you launched the new website, where can people go to see who are the 70 locations and the quality and the contact person for those providers? Yeah. I know you have a table here, yes. but for, for long-term residents, people should know there's 70 providers in Cousinton, who mm -hmm. they are, the level of quality, and the contact person for folks. Do we yeah. have that available? So what I, a couple responses. One, uh, so folks should know that we actually have a 888-545-2600 uh, number that operates 24 hours, seven days a week. You can contact, call that number. Um, uh, a live person will uh, answer, and certainly to the extent that you are uh, looking to participate in treatment, they will direct you to treatment. In addition to that, if you go on our website, um, you can see um, there is a map of the providers and where they are located at, along with uh, the type of uh, the levels of intensity of treatments that they provide. Um, there is also, um, uh, we have on our website a fact sheet that lists uh, kind of, you know, again, uh, all the providers, particularly um, by category. So there's a, you know, these are all the substance use providers who, and outpatient, intensive outpatient, um, these, the, those that are providing medication assisted treatment. And so that information is available. Contact person and the person responsible for that site? Is, is incorrect. That information is correct. Okay, thank you. The chair recognizes that Councilman Swola has joined us. Thank you. Council chair recognizes uh, Councilman Green. Yeah, can I just <laughs> say something real, real quick? And I don't know if this is under exactly your auspices because you were talking about treatment. Obviously, all that is very important. How much have you looked into the sources of, of people getting addicted? I'm particularly talking about over prescribing of medications, that kind of thing. Has, has that been something you, you've looked at? Or? Well, I mean, so there has been, uh, we know coming out of uh, the uh, mayor's task force to combat the opioid epidemic, there were the four broad strategies, prevention, education, treatment, overdose prevention, and then criminal justice involvement. So there's been concerted efforts, certainly working with uh, the health department to get information out to prescribers uh, to share information about inappropriate uh, opioid prescribing and to reduce the number of opioid prescribing so uh, there has been uh, that information is we're working with again the health department to get that information out to physicians across the board so that they have a sense as to uh, what their prescribing patterns are there's also been um, a host of information provided that says uh, you know look at alternative treatments to uh, opioid and so we've been I think uh, pretty um, expansive in, in sharing that information and trying to address that issue from a both prevention and early intervention perspective. No, I appreciate that, and the health commissioner has been you know, very active in that. I have to say, really quickly, uh, Councilwoman Batts and I introduced a bill that just got passed out of committee that 
tries to put some regulations on the pharma industry uh, because that is, I think, a, a big concern about the that leads to over prescribing. We tried to regulate gifts, register them to know where they are. This bill originally started with the administration. Councilwoman Bass and I have taken it up. And just for the record, everybody here, we're hoping to get this passed. It comes up, it can come up on Thursday. We'll see what happens there, okay? But I think that is a key. Obviously, what you're doing is very important, but I think trying to stop it before it gets to that level, before that downward spiral starts. I think is extremely important and that's what we're trying to do we know this is a multi-pronged issue and it takes multi uh, solutions if you will and that's what we're we're trying to approach from that angle too with, with everything else you're doing so just for the record okay thank you madam chair chair recognizes uh councilwoman gim and then councilwoman Brown. thank you madam chair um so i appreciate uh some of the services that dbh ids has been giving out um you know, I, I think the impact in the community has been profound on young people in particular. Could you talk a little bit about some of the school-based work that you're doing at all in some of the schools? I think uh, in collaboration with CBH, we were able to bring in uh, a number of social workers into schools. So, you know, helping me understand what are, what are the kinds of school-based work that you're doing um, with the school district or other schools in the area to help young people um, in the community understand that um, you know there are there are many different they, they need a lot of support um, trying to understand what's happening around them and we want to make sure that they have it yeah uh, thank you council councilwoman again it's a, it's a great question I think as you point to so uh, we have worked um, in terms of both uh, DBH IES and CBH being a part and uh, working with the school system uh, to uh, bring up the support team for educational partnership that was the uh, the step program that you uh, just alluded to where there are uh, the four disciplines that include the social workers case managers a behavioral consultant and then a, essentially a family navigator um, bringing that program up in 22 schools I think that that is certainly part of a broader approach to take uh, to get uh, more prevention uh, beyond that uh, which we ones are here in this community where does the step program apply in this community? Which schools would it apply to? So uh, I can give you a list of exactly where they are. I, I didn't bring that with me, but we can make sure that we get that information out so exactly where they are. And then uh, beyond that, uh, we have, uh, through the department and, and CBH, uh, been working with the school systems for a significant period of time. So we have a prevention program. So all total, uh, through our prevention programs and our treatment, we actually are in 250 uh, of the uh, of the schools, um, and we provide again a range of, of prevention, uh, treatment services. Um, we actually, in, in addition, we also have been working uh, with the school system around um, making looking at how, uh, for example, our be, um, behavioral behavioral. Um, health uh, rehabilitation services, um, how that program has rolled out, and we are looking at also our uh, school therapeutic services program. Looking forward to say, uh, does this program continue to meet the needs of uh, the students in the school system? Uh, working with them about potentially, uh, probably in a year or two, doing maybe a whole new procurement to say, um, you know, to, to identify a model that most effectively uh, serves those kids. So it really is a, a, a range in terms of services that we have provided uh, through the school system. Uh, there's also some specific focus that we do on uh, with, uh, through some of our providers working with uh, youth who are at risk for substance use disorder um, and doing, again, some family work going in. Uh, doing that preventative work to um, inform uh, families on, again, the signs and symptoms of someone who may be experiencing a substance use disorder and to show that there's actually a different pathway forward. Again, uh, we're in 250 schools and that work has been ongoing. Yeah, uh, so just for clarity, you know, I, I, I'm very appreciative of and recognize that DBH has a lot of programs. I think I'm looking for depth and not like breadth across the system. So. There is a particular crisis that we're facing. There's particular schools and communities that we know are, are very vulnerable, and we know the geographic boundaries within which they happen. So I guess I'm curious about, so I know we talked about the STEP program, and I, I have the list somewhere. I was just trying to see if you knew, you know, in this community, whether you could say um, where, where those specific schools are. But 
Um, I, you know, like again, I, I want to make sure that we uh, we're being very targeted. We we there are a lot of services that the school district offers, but um, when we are when when young people are going through extremely difficult times, the community is suffering. Young people suffer ten times harder, and they can't even put into words what they're experiencing because it's all around them and it feels overwhelming. So that's why we wanted to put a nurse and counselor in every school. That's why we wanted to. Um, explore the STEP program, try and do something different other than what we've done in all the other programs. But I'm curious about, you know, like how deep can we go with, with schools and to get some concrete outcomes rather than just rattle off the programs that we already have. So, you know, I'm pushing a little bit here and I'm going to push the district on the same question too. They should have sharp answers and I need to know names of schools, numbers of children served, like I want to hear outcomes. I want to know like that these young people are really responding to this because we're putting our effort into this step program. So we want to make sure there's something coming out of it. The only thing I wanted to add, I'm Joan Ernie. I'm, I'm, I'm Joan Ernie. I'm the CEO of Community Behavioral Health. Um, and in concert with what David reported, for this particular community, uh, we did um, do a number of things. And so I don't have, I, I can give you the data with the number of kids, but a couple of things really from the beginning. One is when we were advised in the very early days of some of the challenges the schools were having in even opening, we rallied our agencies and said, can you go out routinely uh, on the street and actually look for and help with uh, you know, kind of looking for kids and families to make sure that you're intervening um, if there's something going on as they were going into the school. So we, we, we did that and implemented that and then now the city has taken on even more safe, safe streets and safe school activities. We also pulled together all of our prevention and STS providers and in the school districts in, the, in this immediate area, the schools in this immediate area, and asked them to make sure that they were you know, going to the principals because the principals have reported to us that it's not only the children, it's the families, it's the principals, it's the teachers. You know, everyone is experiencing a level of trauma that has been of concern. So they gone to ask, you know, what can we do? What can we do to support you? What can we do uh, in addition? We also have Cora, who is here tonight, who does prevention services mm -hmm. and really um, connects with those uh, agencies and those schools particularly where they're trying to do deeper dives with, with children. So some of the ch data we will have will be more general because we're not going to label those kids as having a Medicaid episode. We're going to talk about the trauma that they might have experienced in that building and are we giving that building enough support. Um, and then I would say finally, actually yesterday, we had, as David pointed out, the convening of the Kensington and Allegheny providers. Again, it's just to create those linkages between agencies, and we did a focus on schools. And we had our educational staff there, along with some of the providers who are providing those services in the school, to talk about are there more best practices we need to do? How are we identifying youth, et cetera? So, you know, we really are, you know, trying to intervene. I think we haven't gotten as much feedback from the schools. Is it making a difference or not yet? And I think that, you know, work in progress. So. I think it's really important um, that, again, we're here talking to Kensington residents because this is the epicenter and the ability to give them a little bit more details about whether it's on our website or schools and look at is there a consistency in what we're doing at the schools, right? So if I'm a parent and I walk into a school, I should know who's the behavioral health provider there, who's the point of contact, if there is that kind of uh, exchange. So I think that's what yeah. we're looking yes. for. And, yeah. and similarly, you know, like there's a Safe Routes program. Those are operated through the city in collaboration with the school district. Like, if the concern is about a route to school in which young people may witness things or feel not safe as they walk, we closed down a number of schools in this community as well. So, you know, like, I want to make sure that we are, we are in communication with our parents, our community members, and our young people so that we should, you know, I want to hear stuff like, yes, we've doubled the number of people monitoring the safe routes, and that the city has to step up to some extent on that and then I want to hear the young people say hey it feels a little bit different for us um, even despite everything that's happening to us we feel like at least there's folks looking out for us when you're you know 10 or whether you're 18 it really you know this is I know you feel this way um, but I, I do I'm gonna be looking and pushing for a little bit more uh, specifics and specific schools and letting the community know which schools have it which schools are on uh, you know on a standby list for it and that the councilwoman and others in the community can direct people towards that.
The other thing I would want to add too, though, is that just in terms of uh, youth voice, we also have uh, youth motivating others uh, through their voices of experience. So we actually have a uh, very active uh, part of the department where, for example, Shahid Dave, uh, who uh, is our youth leader in uh, part, uh, the part of our system of care grant where there is a consistent uh, effort working with families who uh, have obviously experienced kind of psychiatric distress that um, they are part of this, uh, giving us information about how we can improve uh, the system, how we can do uh, work with the families, and in fact, how uh, youth can play a role uh, in leadership going forward. So I want to put that out there as a, some another uh, strategy that we're using in, in that. And I think, again, we can get back to you guys around some of the specific numbers of how many youth move uh, members we have and then some of the work that they are moving forward. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, good evening. Good evening. One direct question and, and then two others to follow. You gave a projected date of 2020 to have the entire network do MAT. Correct. And so what might be uh, the impediments that, that may prohibit or get in the way of your achieving that 2020 deadline? Yeah. So uh, there are uh, probably a couple challenges. Uh, one is, is just in terms of um, getting um, all of the providers uh, to, to complete the training um, in terms of the, I had mentioned, for example, the buprenorphine waiver training so that then uh, we have, uh, if you will, kind of physicians um, at every site, uh, at, within every provider, so we get from, we make that distance and go from 65% to 100%. And then candidly, there also are going to be um, some providers who say we want to take a medication-free uh, pathway and that uh, they essentially is saying that, you know, we really believe that recovery is possible without using uh, medication-assisted treatment. So that'll be, a, that'll be a challenge too. Now, we definitely believe that, you, you know, every pathway to recovery should be explored. It's just that the science is very clear about, uh, particularly as it pertains to opioid use disorder, uh, utilizing medication-assisted treatment is the best pathway to recover. Related question. So the, do you fund the providers? Yes. Okay, so... So if you fund the providers, I would think that training should not be optional. Training should be required mm -hmm. by a, a, a certain deadline to achieve the goals that you're, you're trying to achieve. And you're absolutely right, Councilwoman. And in fact, that's uh, what we've indicated is that, you know, so it's actually mandated um, that the providers participate in those trainings, but giving them the opportunity to make the adjustment uh, and then set that deadline by 2020. Okay. To punctuate Councilwoman Gim's point regarding uh, uh, the depth of it. I too believe in saturation. In fact, given the magnitude and the scale of this problem in Councilwoman, in Councilwoman Sanchez District, there needs to be over saturation. And schools become one contact point for young people. Um, you've mentioned schools, you've mentioned prevention, STS, you've mentioned providers, you've mentioned CORA. We have senior citizen centers, we have libraries, any place where two people are gathered. I'm curious to know, where's the glue, where's the thread that ties all those worlds together in a coordinated way to attack this issue? Is, the, is government intended to be the glue? Who's the thread separate from Councilwoman Sanchez? So what I will say is that um, we, uh, through our a division of planning and innovation, uh, okay. we certainly participate in uh, many uh, community meetings. We uh, 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 attend uh, kind of health forums. Uh, we share information about uh, what's available through not only DBH, DBH IDS, but our partner entities. Uh, there is concerted effort to make sure that, uh, again, that the, the work that, that's coming out. So for example, some of the work that we do is through our evidence-based uh, evidence practice and innovation center, EPIC is uh, to share information around uh, the most effective treatment strategies. And so part of what we've done too is we've made sure that, um, and this goes beyond the various entities that you mentioned, um, that uh, they have information around, for example, um, you know, trauma-informed treatment. Uh, so whether you are, you know, uh, I'll give you even a better example. We do work with grants as parents. Okay. Uh, 
And so in our work with Grant's parents, obviously that's intergenerational work yes, where yes. we have shared with them, you know, so about trauma-informed uh, care, about trauma-informed treatment, uh, about, again, good prevention strategies. And so uh, as they are looking and certainly um, at, at developing uh, their kind of their various relationships, we are an active partner with Grants' parents and in sharing information. And that's just an example. I and mean, I think that we do that uh, kind of pretty much across the board. My, my, my final comment and observation would be um, any place where two people are, two young people are gathered, the, that CVS, that Rite Aid, that physician, that clergy member, that case manager, that social worker, those, what I'm not hearing is a glue and a thread that ties that all together on a re where folks meet on a regular basis to examine where we are, what progress we've made since that last meeting, who's responsible for doing X, Y, Z over the next 30 days. And the template I have for that that I, that I believe could have some value, under Mayor Street's administration, he had a blue ribbon panel that met for an entire year to look at how we look at systems for kids. We met monthly. There were, there were a subcommittees that reported to the chair and all of those committees met monthly, and, at, and, and for, a, for a year, we examined how systems were doing and where recommendations needed to be made, and then in the second term, those recommendations were implemented. Mm -hmm. So a similar template, I believe, would have value here in bringing all the providers together, the STS providers, the provincials, the heads of the schools, physicians, clergy, CBOs, like Grants' parents, so that everybody has an articulated role and how we can address, uh, 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 further deepen our attack on the problem. Because it's happening, but I'm not hearing glue and thread that ties it together in, in the short time that, that I've, I've been here and, and what I've heard Councilwoman Sanchez talk about often. And the closest we would get is, so uh, DBH IDS, we actually have an advisory board okay. uh, that then consists of, and what I didn't mention is we also have, um, uh, part of that advisory board includes faith and spiritual affairs. Okay. And so, um, it would be faith and spiritual affairs. In fact, we actually have labor represented um, on that advisory board. We have the providers represented on the advisory board. It's both uh, child uh, and adult providers. And so, uh, and then we actually, that advisory board, it, it used to be, um, there were, uh, we had a number of different advisory boards. We brought those all together so that it would be much more integrated. And, and exactly, and, and information shared across. And not just to meet and commiserate, but to meet with assigned tasks where folks are held accountable for those assigned tasks, where their reports given on what the progress has been related to the goals that are trying to be achieved. Because meeting is, is great. Commiserating is great, but it means nothing if, if they're not achievable, uh, articulated goals and outcomes at the end of those meetings. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm going to want to stick with my 90 minutes, but I will say that we will have a further discussion, particularly around CBH reforms. And again, what I'm looking for, uh, and particularly out of hearings like this, I want my long-term Kensington residents to walk away with some of this in their hands. Mm -hmm. I want them to know there's a website, we know who the doctors are, if there's a problem, who do we call, um, as it relates, again, to the 70 providers. When kids walk into a school, I mean, we had a, a successful uh, uh, morning this morning at Elkins showing um, some, some of the um, success around walking corridors. But again, we gotta get better at, at connecting the dots for folks, right? I want people to walk out of here with some concrete stuff. Um, and we're getting better. Um, so to try to honor the clock, I'm gonna quickly let Liz um, speak, give us a little bit of update on where we are around the housing issue um, so that we can talk about project resilience and then I want folks to listen to the community. So I want to and get there. <laughs> two points in closing real quick, uh, Councilman. So one, just to point to, as you indicated at the beginning, so we actually have materials uh, on the uh, and the table in the back so that folks can walk out kind of with, with things, with material in hand. And then secondly, I think, um, as you'll hear from uh, Tumar and Joanne, I think the Philadelphia Resiliency Project, and this goes, uh, Councilwoman, to your question too, where there were 35 departments that came together. I think you'll hear more about kind of the, the kind of comprehensive approach uh, when they speak. So I just wanted to say that. Yes, Councilwoman. One more thing before you say. Um, <clears throat> we, we have a lot of good providers here, but we have seen in the past where we had some providers that left receiving a lot of money for fraud. Um, is there any way 
that we could make sure that's documented on the website too, that people realize mm -hmm. what is going on so that we know who the Stay bad providers from. are in the community and to try to avoid them in the, in the future. So, um, Councilman Squilla, a part of our, our process certainly is, you know, I think that we have uh, a pretty extensive um, uh, oversight, uh, kind of quality, compliance, um, in inclusive of our network improvement and accountability, uh, collaborative. And, and so when those situations come to our attention, certainly what happens uh, generally as, a, as an end result and an outcome, uh, those individuals, those providers are moved out of our network. And so, but I think your your question specifically is to indicate when those providers have moved out, and we'll certainly look When they you. are on probation, we need a report card. I wanna know that of the 70 providers in Cousinton, who is on probation, who has had issues, and who who is, so people know that we're monitoring that, right? And if, if for the sake of transparency, if people are getting government money, we need to know, right? This person is on probation for child services, or we've removed this contract <laughs> because of this issue, because you're talking to a community that has seen providers closed down with thousands of patients. So I'm just saying, you know, and I know we're working towards that. We're on a website, <coughs> be more transparent. I want the report card, right? And I want the community to have an input around what is quality, right? And, and Councilwoman, we will we will send drafts to your office so we can get your input before we go. We take it to scale so that we make I sure. I want the community to see it because ultimately. Being a good provider is I should not have to walk down the block and know you're there and you're being disruptive, right? I want the physical plant to be clean, basic stuff, right? So, and I think we have not seen that in Kensington, and so that's why that list of 70 providers and people being able to see it, then we can get some of that feedback. And so that 215-888-2400 number is for people to access any of those providers. The 888-545-2600. Oh, 545. 545-2600. 2600, and that information is in the back table. <coughs> Can ask a question right now? You can come later. Ask a question. <laughs> All right, we're going to let Liz real quick, and, um, and then we'll go to the Resilience Project. Thank you, Liz. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Um, I was asked to focus on the, the expansion of housing opportunities and specifically uh, the role of the Temple Episcopal Campus to host two new sites for services for people experiencing homelessness um, and opioid use disorder. Uh, so we're excited to see the augmented services as part of a medical campus, which we think is an appropriate site for these services to be offered. And we're very appreciative of the partnership of Temple Healthcare System. Uh, the first is the establishment of Beacon House as a navigation, low barrier navigation center for people exiting street homelessness. Um, located near the L stop at B, the Huntington L stop at B Street, it will hold 40 beds for men, women, and couples. It'll be open 24 hours a day. It will have on-site staff and security. Uh, we will ask that the provider establish a community advisory board to ensure transparency, responsiveness, and accountability to the neighborhood. Um, so this is an innovation that we are adding in, new, in the new site. Uh, this site is slated to open early next summer. In addition, it will provide daytime services such as laundry, showers, and bathrooms, which we have found to be successful in engaging people in accessing services. Um, and we hope to continue to engage outdoor meal providers to host meals in indoor settings as we have been doing in the Hub of Hope. Uh, we're working with Temple Health Systems to assure that individuals using Beacon House can access the comprehensive physical and behavioral health services offered by the hospital. So rather than recreating them on site to use the resources that are already there. The second project is the proposed development of the School of Nursing building on Huntington Avenue into 62 units of affordable housing by Project Home. They have site control, which, the, which positions them to apply for the low-income housing tax credit to finance the development and operation. Uh, they've also secured the written support of the Norris Square Civic Alliance, the registered community organization. So not only will this development provide affordable housing opportunity, but it'll activate one of the many empty buildings in the, near, in the neighborhood. But as you know, the tax credit takes about three years to go through um, if you're lucky. 
Uh, therefore, Project Home has taken the extraordinary step of establishing a temporary site at Sacred Heart on West Hunting Park Avenue, a campus owned by the Dominican nuns where they used to care for terminally ill people who were poor. Project Home will operate two housing programs on this campus, a 20-bed respite for people exiting the street, which will open around Christmas time, and a 40-bed longer-term housing for those who are in fully in recovery but need supportive housing. When the development of the school, the school of Nursing opens in about three years, Sacred Heart residents will have the opportunity to move to the new site. Um, the second 40, so the first 20 beds are scheduled to open around Christmas and the second um, around Memorial Day. So those are our plans right now with Project Home, uh, with a provider to be determined, and the Temple Episcopal Campus. And some of the initial funds were part of the funding that City Council has just approved. So real quickly, one of the, um, just so that as folks have heard that I have said no more of these sites in Kensington is because we have already have enough in the pipeline. This is a citywide problem and we want to be equitable in the distribution of how these locations get cited. For the purposes of the two current respite centers, one which it was is coming to an end soon, what is the current plan for the two respite centers that we have on Kensington Avenue? Um, currently, um, they are intended to sunset. We don't know exactly when. Part of it depends what other sites we can get online and what the street population is and getting people in. Uh, we need the beds for sure to be able to resolve the Emerald Street, the last major encampment. And then I think we'll want to turn our attention to K and A and resolving that encampment. So um, it certainly is our intention to look at the totality of services offered. Uh, the one thing that we did do at your suggestion, Councilwoman, was we did open one day at a time on West Lehigh Avenue, and it was a slow start, but it's at capacity. And what's really interesting is that when we've had focus groups with people in the prevention point respites, um, when they're able to get permanent housing or reunite with family or um, move on, they talk about getting out. And so um, they, and ODAT has been a really good stepping stone for people. So we really have taken to heart a holistic approach to the extent we can with getting site control. The deadline for Emerald Street? Uh, we don't have a deadline at this point in time because we don't have the beds yet. We're working on it. That's not what we heard at our last meeting. We were given a date of January 15th, which means a posting of December 15th. We don't have beds right now for that. That is a problem. Okay. You're telling me it's also a problem that it's going to be down into the teens tonight and there's people on the street and we don't want anybody to freeze to death. Okay. So I'm going to, for purposes of time, I'm going to allow Cynthia Figueroa, the Commissioner of the Department of Behavioral Health and Human Services, to come forward because she has to leave. One of the things we continuously hear when we have these discussions is what is the city doing with about our children and our after school programming and I want long-term residents of Kensington to um, hear directly from the administration our commitment um, to funding after school opportunities partnership opportunities for the young people uh, of Kensington so thank you Commissioner So there are three step schools in the area. I just wanted to get back to that. Um, it's Elgin, Sheridan, and Cramp. So I just want to do Elkins, Sheridan, Sheridan, and, and Cramp. Cramp. And can you explain again for the public? The step school includes a social worker who serves the entire school, as well as what other services? A case manager, a behavioral health consultant, and a family navigator. Those, um, those other three disciplines all will come on um, during um, the second half of the calendar year 19. Buenas noches, hello. Um, thank you for having me here. I just wanna, I'm not gonna read the whole testimony in the interest of time. I wanna just address, um, and knowing that a number of you are former educators uh, doing our homework and knowing we're coming back home. For those of you who don't know, I serve this uh, district area for a good portion of my career. So it's great to be back home in, in North Philadelphia. Um, as it relates to after school programs, um, we are very pleased to report that there are 29 programs in this district, of which 20 of them operate in uh, schools. And of that 20, 18 happen in school districts. 
This flyer, for the folks who are in this room, there's plenty of them here. It gives you the list of the location, the school, and it, whether or not it's sort of elementary, middle, or high school, so please take those. At the bottom of this paper, as well as the top, it tells you who to call, whether you want to do a website or a phone call to direct you to these sites, um, and then also directs you to general information. The other resource that I think is very important to share is that because we're Department of Human Services, folks assume that because of addiction um, that we automatically would remove a child. And actually, unlike other counties, we don't. But we need to demonstrate that the child can be safe in the home, even if there is an addiction. That's a very complicated thing to work through. So on that note, we have also in the back our parenting resources. And there's a number of parenting resources that we have available. And in order to simplify it for all community members, there is one phone call, one number you can call um, that guides you as well as a website in terms of what are the parenting programs in your community as well as parent cafes. So there's support groups, there's groups for parents who have kids actively engaged at DHS that are active in care, and then just if you're interested in having parenting classes. We talked a lot about the needs of older youth we're also very supportive of intensive, another resource in the back, uh, intensive prevention services for older youth who may find themselves wrapped up in the midst of the challenges of the opioid crisis. Um, I do want to highlight an interesting dynamic that we've seen, and um, my fellow colleagues in Health and Human Services, is that the opioid epidemic has not seen an expansion in the number of families who come into child welfare. As a matter of fact, we've reduced the number of families who are with DHS by close to 500 individuals in over a year. Um, so folks are surprised by that. Um, part of that is the demographic of what we're seeing in terms of who is um, being impacted, but we also know there's a lot of grandparents. So we also work with grandsons' parents. We know there's a lot of second and generation who are taken care of uh, their children while their while their grandchildren while their children are struggling with addiction. So um, we're trying to figure out all ways through our prevention services to make sure. But um, we we drive these specific services and we <coughs> try to simplify it in terms of access um, and availability to the community. So someone seeking treatment and services who have a child, walk me through um, how we're handling that. So we want folks to be able sure. to come and say, we need, we need help. Um, how, how are we handling that? So thanks to the tremendous partnership that we have with Behavioral Health and CBH, we actually have um, staff that are embedded in our community umbrella organization. So if there's an active case and it's an in-home case, we would be working with that partnership to determine how's the best way to navigate getting them into treatment services if they're not already in treatment services. Um, we also have to navigate whether or not somebody is not uh, currently ready to enter into um, treatment services, and that's something that the case managers have to navigate. And so we, um, what folks don't always get to see behind the scenes is that our day-to-day -day work with community behavioral health and DBH, IDS, in terms of making that determination because we're we're the child welfare social workers we're not the um, clinicians um, and so we lean on them as partners to, to figure out how to navigate that in the best way possible thank you any questions for the commissioner all right we're going to ask this to come back Councilman Scola has a couple of questions for her and then i'm going to ask quickly i know reagan prepared to talk about her 24-hour NET program, but I do want to give time for members of the community to take advantage of having all these folks here. So thank you. Thank you for your patience. I'm sorry, Council. Just a quick question, and I know... Um, there are no quick questions. <laughs> <laughs> Council Sands just touched on it, and, and we had thought that the um, July and January 15th date was going to be something that we've been telling our residents. And the problem we have sometimes when we, we tell people things and it don't come true, they think we lie to them. And so when we do throw some dates out there, we, we knew that the people who were going into the respites from Frankfurt Avenue would be there approximately 30 days to 45 days and then hopefully move on. Is that not happening? We don't have time limits in our site, in our sites. What we have, um, well the requirement is, so I'm sorry for any misunderstanding. Well, the requirement is that they have a housing plan within the first 30 days that they are there. So um, it takes time. People are very, very sick when they come in, um, and it takes time for them to get on.
schedule to get their re re recover some physical health, hopefully to get into the medication assisted treatment, to get ID, to, to just get fed on a regular basis, to get warm after being inside, to get clean, all of those things take time. And so even if we did have a time limit, I don't have any place for those people to move in 30 days and it would be very disruptive. It would be counterproductive, really, to force them to move. What we were hoping was that we would have another site online. Um, that hasn't happened yet. We're still working on it. Once we have another site online, then we'll be able to resolve the, can, the Emerald encampment. Um, but, and you know, as you know, the law in Philadelphia r prohibits the, the criminalization of homelessness. So people cannot be forcibly removed for being homeless. We have to provide beds for them to move into. And if we don't have sites that can open, then we don't have beds for them. And they have to be sites that they are willing to go to. Um, because we can't, it, it's not, it, 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 we, we just have no way of forcing them into services. So I am apologize for any misunderstanding that there's been, but this is what the situation is. Can you clarify, because you mentioned there were 20 additional slots created by a temporary site from Project Home. So what are those 20 beds going to be used for? Yeah, those 20 beds, when they come online at the end of this month, will be used for people coming in from Emerald, and from other sites, some of them will um, some of them will be coming from other parts of the city based on vulnerability. Yeah, so those twenty beds, there's a hundred people in the Emerald encampment. So, and I think it's really important for, for us to clarify for the purposes of, of the folks. We do have beds, but we don't have necessarily the beds that either people want to go to or that allows them to continue to use while we transition. At this point in time, we have zero beds. Because it's we, we have 50 people who are sitting up every night at one of our men's shelters. We have 20 people sitting, women sitting up in another shelter. Our winter beds are coming online, and we anticipate that they will also be filled. So that was going to be my next question. I know Eva wants to get on board. Every winter we set up how many additional winter beds? It'll be about 300 additional winter beds. So why didn't we do that earlier if we had programmed the encampment? We, we are. The beds are coming on on schedule. This is, a, this is a matter of the budget and what we can afford to do. And so those beds are coming online. We've added 129. This is the winter beds. We've added 129 full-time beds. Um, so those beds are all coming online. Councilman, did you want to... The beds depend on the budget, and you don't have money for these beds? Eva, say your name for the record. Um, Eva Gladstein, Deputy Managing Director for Health and Human Services. I see the councilman being frustrated. Um, so our, well, He's beyond <coughs> frustrated, but he's usually very nice about it. <laughs> Agreed. Um, it, it depends both upon budget, and, and we put money in the budget to begin bringing beds on in November and others coming on in December. It also depends upon the capacity of the organizations and their ability to get the beds up on the schedule and, and the location of the site availability. So there are several factors that go into it. Um, what I wanted to reassure um, members of the committee is that it is, it is still our intention to resolve the Emerald Street encampment in mid-January. Um, but I want to be clear that, um, to support Liz's point, that we have to have enough sites um, that are available. And one of the concerns that I think everybody on the committee and in the community has experienced is that if we don't have sites that people will go to, then we have more people on the street. And we've seen more people on the street in less organized encampments or without tents, but still sleeping. So um, as we are able to help people with their housing plans in the two sites move on, as um, the Project Home site at Sacred Heart opens up, which will only be 20 beds, and they're aiming for Christmas, but we don't know for sure, because you know it's a development project. We are continuing to push very, very hard but I don't want, I want to say that's our intent, but whether or not it's January 15th or January 20th or something like that, we will sure, be sure to keep you informed about that. So I don't want to be just, you know. I just want to be real clear, clear that we've also been very clear because we are, we are now very experienced on the nuances around posting, notification, and bets. 
the frustration you hear from Councilman Squilla and myself is that we have a code blue situation where every year we prepare hundreds of additional beds and we feel that those beds should have been prioritized for Emerald Street because we made a public commitment to people that we were going to post in December, because I think I was very clear about posting in December for January. To Liz's point, this is a crisis. It's 15 degrees outside. And I feel like people feel like they have more time. And I say this every time I have a hearing. We act like we have time. We don't have time. <coughs> so how many additional beds, cold blue beds, do we have? How many are coming on the line and how many are going to be committed to Emerald Street? And I want that commitment now and I want a date now that we're going to stick to because we told residents one thing. And if we're coming, if we're going to have hundreds come online, there's no reason why they can't be ded dedicated to the people on Emerald Street. So. I don't have the information to make a commitment today and I don't want to make a commitment that will be a false commitment. Liz, how many beds do we have coming on at Code Blue? Uh, 300 winter beds are coming on and then there'll be an additional probably 50 to 75 when it's cold. So we have 300 cold blue beds and you are telling me, Eva, that you can't commit today that we're going to commit the 60 to 80 that we know require for us to break down a camp. Is that what you're saying? You're not willing to commit if we have 300 beds coming online that we dedicate 80 of those so we can remove the Emerald Street encampment. Well, we haven't done enough outreach to know how many beds we need, but we have well over 100 people at Emerald Street now. So if I use your assumption of 60 to 80, we can make those, we can offer those. It does not mean people will accept them given the circumstances. But we can do notice and we could do everything we've done before. Right. And we may we can do that and we may be less successful than we were before in actually clearing and holding the again. The, the issue becomes we know that Emerald is gonna be much more complicated than the other sites have been, right? And this is why we've allowed this kind of the this the last one. So I have a feeling that even where we were successful in the other encampment removals, Emerald is going to take a different dimension. So I'm going to ask one more time, if we have 300 plus 50 beds coming online, why can't the administration commit today that they will pri prioritize 80 of those because we recognize that Emerald Street is a crisis and that we are upon a deadline that we told people we were going to do? We can commit those beds. What we cannot say is that the encampment resolution will be successful if those are the only beds that are available. If we do the notification, as we've done in the past, right, we can begin, we, we know that this is not going to be as easy or as is going to operate in the same time span. So we need to be a little bit flexible and lim limbo. I'm not looking for the perfect, I'm looking for a pathway. So, so um, we can certainly look at that. The issue then is you may end up with people if, who are on other streets. They become dispersed around other places in the neighborhood. We can begin the process, right? We set up a 30-day notice and everything. It's, this is behavior. People modify their behavior accordingly. And in that process, excuse me, we're not going to allow people to scream from the hall. This is an official ruling. Everybody gets their moment. We knew, we know that it may take more than 30 days to clear out Emerald Street. So you, you're telling me that unless you could get it done in 30 days, you're not willing to do it. And I'm saying let's begin the process because it's much easier to deal with Emerald Street at 50 people than right now that we're at 120 and exploding. So what we have done in the last three encampment resolutions that has been successful is that we had a model that we've been followed. And we haven't been driven by politics. We've been driven by what makes the most sense for the individuals and the neighborhoods. And this is the will that was expressed to us by the civic associations. And it's a combination of providing that 30-day notice, which gives a sense of urgency, because substance use disorder is a behavioral disability. And that sense of urgency and the deadline motivates behavior, combined with the low barrier respite that is in a place with a provider who they will accept 
because we do not have the ability to force them in. And so we could certainly post and we could say you have to leave and there's a bed in West Philadelphia or North Philadelphia or somewhere else. If they don't accept that bed, then they may be living somewhere else on the streets in, the, in wherever they choose. So it's a matter of whether we want to follow a model that has been effective both for the neighborhood because we have resolved it has not been effective for and the because it, is. it has been effective for the folks in addiction the people in the neighborhood have been patient so we have three encampments that have been resolved um, the nave the civics asked us that the other encampments that the other tunnel posted so that encampments did not form there we honored that request and the police have been enforcing that and that has been very effective and so that has been the model that we've been following, and that's what we still are planning to do. Councilman Schiller, do you have any other questions? No, thank you. We need to move on. Councilman again. Do you, so is there a, a one, um, you know, we worked together a little bit on the anti-eviction task force. We talked a lot about what are the future things that could uh, address um, some of the crises that we're seeing, one of the discussions has been about shallow rent subsidies. You know, obviously, does that, is there, so with the new allocation of money from city council, is there a possibility to use shallow rent subsidies to assist certain people who might qualify for some of these beds, see if they can seek an alternative, thereby opening up more space or offering shallow rent subsidies or some kind of voucher thing that has that been discussed as a possibility yes. of yes. helping and, uh, with this? Yes, oh, and we absolutely you, are doing that's that. That's part of the budget, $5 million yeah, that's allocation what I thought. that we got was to allow for some of those shallow and, and will that, I mean, is that It will not take care of, of, it, it of everything. Right. So it is happening. We have, um, this year we've added 40 shallow rents. We've added rapid rehousing. We've added um, permanent supportive housing. Um, we added housing first. I think about 50 people have already started to move into the housing first, into the shallow rent. So we are using that for people where it's appropriate to help them move out of recovery houses and out of the respites or transitional housing. And that's how we get the flow through the system so that we open up those low barrier beds. So yes, thank you very much for that funding. It is enabling people to move into those options. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So we're going to move on to Project Resilience. Um, huh? I said seven, so Tumar and Joanne are going to be quick so we can listen to residents. Um, if, if, and I'm going to call out some of the residents. We have Sterling Johnson and we have his written testimony. I don't know if the doctor's still here. Rosalinda Lopez, Ramon Cruz, Elijah Desamora, and Adrian Rivera. Reyes. I apologize, folks. I'm going to try to honor this time clock as much as possible. So you're happy about that. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Timur Alexander from the Manager of the Work Design. We're going to ask folks to get their meeting to leave quietly, please. Be before, we, uh, before we start to do our official project resiliency presentation, I just want to say one of the things that Liz didn't mention was that the funding that you all sort of voted for last week, the appropriations, one of the big items, one of the big budget items was a large scale navigation center that we're currently looking at a certain, we're currently exploring locations and sites for. If we able to, if we're able to stand that up, that gives us the ability to put about 100 to 150 folks off the street into a building, and it allows us to sort of speed up the closure of the encampment. So, one of, you know, that's 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 and that's a big piece for us, right? And you all have worked with us, given us suggestions. We're we we've been working hard trying to find locations for that. We have a location not in the seventh district. We're hopefully next week talking to. To some community folks and the council member where that location is sort of situated at and trying to stand that up but we understand and relate to your frustration as it relates to that encampment we want it closed it's the worst encampment police wants it closed everyone who sort of is involved with project resiliency wants it closed we'll, we'll get back to you all on that i just wanted you all to know that we're working i mean that's that's a big piece that we're working on actively so thank you um but let's it will be brief we'll, okay we'll 
Good evening, everyone. I'm Noah Poison. I'm the Deputy Director for the Office of Emergency Management. The Mayor's Executive Order that declared an emergency to combat the opioid public health crisis tasked the Office of Emergency Management with coordinating our citywide response. Our Emergency Operations Center, or EOC, brings together decision makers and allows for face-to-face -face problem solving to ensure our response is smart and decisive. The EOC model cuts through red tape and allows for quick action and course correction. In the executive order, I identified seven overarching goals and assigned a city department as the lead for each goal. Those city departments are the lead of their mission area, but they do not work alone. The Philadelphia Resilience Project has brought together close to 40 city agencies and represented by almost 80 individuals to support all seven mission areas. When the emergency declaration is for 90 days, the first two weeks we convene daily meetings to support strategic planning for the seven mission area leads. During that time, we finalized immediate, short-term, and long-term goals for each mission. The media goal deadline was November 15, 2018. Short-term goals will mark the end of the 90-day period in the initial executive order, which is December 31, 2018. And long-term goals are defined as those expected to be completed within three to, month, three, three to nine months, June 30, 2018. And the EOC has been providing weekly updates on our progress at www.bella.gov forward slash opioids under blog posts. And Tumor will now walk us through the seven mission areas with a focus on community support and impact. Thank you, Noah. Uh, mission area one is re eliminating encampments. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to walk through all of the goals. I'll, I'll mention the mission areas. I'll let Joanna talk about uh, her two mission areas as it relates to some of the community support, community engagement, and the cleaning projects that we've sort of encountered here. Then we'll be, we'll be open for questions both from uh, members of council, then also we'll stay for questions from the audience. Uh, mission area one, eliminating encampments. Mission area two, reducing criminal activity. Mission area three, reducing unsheltered population. Mission area four, reducing trash and litter. Mission area five, reduction of overdose and harm prevention. Mission area six, increasing treatment options. Mission area seven, mobilizing community resources. We've created and developed over 100 immediate short-term and long-term goals. Uh, last month, we reported out on the immediate goals on December 18th in this very building. We'll report out on our short-term goals. Um, allow, I, I'm sorry, my note says, uh, just allow me to present some of the goals. Allow me, to, allow me to just highlight some of the goals. So, missionary one, you guys heard a lot about the encampments piece, the last remaining encampment is Emerald Street, so we, we plan that we commit to coming up with a plan to eliminate that. Initially, we talked about January 15th. We want to stick as close as we can to that date. We'll, we'll go back between the next few days and work on getting a concise and clear message back out to the community as it relates to that. Uh, one of the other goals is developing comprehensive strategies to prevent encampments from relocating or reforming. Uh, that's, a, that's a project that we're doing with the police department, with DBH, with homeless outreach, with uh, our CLIP folks, and you know a lot of that revolves around us getting complaints and getting uh, recommendations from the community, sort of letting us know where these camps are popping up at. We're trying to respond in a rapid fashion to these, and hope that hope that we're being successful with that. Uh, mission area two: reducing criminal activity. Just Councilwoman Sanchez talked a little bit today, and Councilwoman Gum talked a little bit about us sort of enhancing and strengthening our existing safe corridor routes to travel for school kids. Just today we launched one at Elkin School. We have three or four other schools, Shepherd, Sheridan, and Willard on our list. And we, we our intention and our plans is to work with the school district, work with parents, work with communities and volunteers to stand these programs up and make them sustainable. Um, and then now I'll, I'll pass the mic over to Joanna. Joanna, uh, to talk about some of our areas and then we'll take questions. So keeping it brief, um, good evening. Um, Joanna Little Cruz, um, Deputy Managing Director of Community Services. The two missions that are I'm going to talk about is Mission 4, Reducing Trash and Litter, and Mission 7, Mobilizing Community Response. These are the two that are really focused on the outward facing um, um, responses to our residents' quality of life issues. So since the um, inception of the, of the signing of the executive order, we have uh, worked to coordinate 126 abandoned vehicles have been towed. Uh, that list um, continues as a very exhaustive list of, of, very, uh, of over 400 vehicles in the neighborhood. 
uh, vacant. Over 32 miles of cleanups have been done by mechanical brooms. We've had um, 67 clean and seals. We know that that's not just a risk for fires, especially in the winter, but also conceals a lot of narcotics trade and um, other um, criminal activity. We've had 5,959 5, graffiti abatements in the neighborhood. 430 vacant lots have been abated, which means has been cleaned. Many of them, um, we're working with the local CDCs and civics um, to activate those um, lots and get them fenced with PHS. 19 tickets have been issued for illegal dumping. You know, short dumping continues to be an issue in the neighborhood. We've ha been working with the water department in which they've done um, 877 cleaning of inlets, which is a, a common complaint in the neighborhood. And um, our parks and recreation is actually at the table as well. And they have removed over uh, 4.55 tonnage of um, trash from their grounds. Mobilizing and moving to Mission 7, mobilizing community residents, some of our response has been uh, we've had an incredible amount of volunteer residents just really coming out and wanting to, to really support their own neighborhoods. We've had over 435 volunteers for community cleanups, um, which include four city departments also participating. We've had four major cleanups since the signing of the executive order. Uh, created a specialized 311 response unit to intake community quality of life complaints. So if, you're call, if you call 311, and press four, all of those, and anything that comes from this um, area, the East Division, goes to that pod. And we are utilizing that data and distributing among the seven um, corresponding um, emission areas. To date, we have 11, uh, 1,190 calls that have been serviced by the unit, of which 824 requests have been confirmed to be resolved through the coordination at the um, Office of Emergency Management and all of the corresponding operational departments. Um, we are seeking actively and working with the Councilwoman, um, Maria Quinones Sanchez, to um, locate a community resource center where we hope to distribute um, cleanup safety kits and um, co-locate Office of Emergency Management um, services as well as um, co-locate a 311. And Councilman Squilla as well has been um, active in this conversation where we hope to bring um, resources to community residents, those long-term community residents, including our, our newly launching um, program, Municipal ID, and working with local agencies in the neighborhood to see how we can support our residents. We've created a volunteer website, serfindly.org, where anyone who's interested in supporting or helping in some way, there's a, soft, a short survey there, if individuals who want to distribute food or distribute any type of goods, um, or just be of service, can go in and sign um, sign up for it, and we are following up accordingly. We also attend and disseminate information of not just the Resilience Project, but we also try to share information through numerous PDAC meetings, community meetings. We have been hosting El Barrio Nuestro, um, the Neighborhood is Ours meeting for the last <coughs> two years. Um, and so we also have 311 present to follow up with individuals. We've also generated a bilingual, um, bi-weekly newsletter uh, that is distributing to more than 5,000 individuals who have signed up for it. Um, we have also cre created an advisory committee. The first meeting is going to be held on Monday the 17th, um, and we just finalized um, the consultation of uh, a fund development contractor as we have to continue to fund many of these various things. Um, and in closing, we know we continue to work um, on, for the quarterly meetings um, and trainings with recovery homes. We have many in this neighborhood, many of which are not necessarily um, sanctioned in our system and so want to be an active partner. And we work not just with behavioral health services but with LNI and um, with PARS, which stands for the Pennsylvania Alliance Recovery uh, uh, Residents. And so we are continuing to work with them in providing quarterly meetings and trainings. So thank you. I want to reiterate for folks to listen. If you call 311 and you dial 4, all of those complaints get driven into project resilience and get priority in the seven service areas. So long-term residents, 311, prompt number 4. 
Yeah, I just wanted to fail to mention that in the audience, a lot of our missionary leads have joined us tonight. So those folks are in the audience, they can just raise their hand. Thank you. Any questions from our um, Councilor Scuola? Yes, thank you. And uh, I do want to say the Resilience Project uh, was very cautiously optimistic when it was first announced. And I have to say there has been a very uh, successful start to the project. And I would thank you for that. Uh, there's been a lot of things happening within the communities, both for the people on the streets, uh, as far as getting them help and resources that they need, and for the surrounding community who's uh, been negatively impacted by what's going on in the streets, which is very important. Um, and I, I know you heard me a little frustrated earlier, but the only part was uh, frustrating in that, you know, when we do ask for a, a budget for what it would need to get things mm -hmm. done, and we provide that budget, that it's still a resource issue, and that, that's the only thing that gets us uh, under concern. We, we want to provide all the resources necessary to make this work, uh, both for the people on the streets and, and the community. So um, we need to continue to work on that communication to make sure that we, we stay focused on that. And also, when we tell people something, we need to be able to stick to that because it does make it difficult to go back. We have to build trust with the community because a lot of them don't trust what we say because of things that happened in the past, whether it was helping the people who are on the streets or whether it's helping the community surrounded by that. And um, so uh, we will, I will, and Maria will, I know, all of council will continue to work with you on that. It was a, you know, a big ask for all of council for an additional budget push for this, and uh, everybody supported unanimously, which very rarely happens. So that's a, that's a good sign. And um, so we want to continue that and uh, continue this process moving forward that we can de definitely can see positive impacts moving as long as we reach our, we reached our short term, our immediate goal, our short term goal was going to be done by the end of the year, and then our long term goal by June 30th. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. I just want to mention that we want to thank you all. We want to thank the community, the civic leaders. A lot, of, a lot of folks in this room have been partners to us in this process. In this process, a lot of folks has given us advice, have sort of helped us out a great deal. So we, we appreciate that, and I wanted. That's why I wanted to just clarify that the resources you all fought hard for last week to help us get that big budget item in there will hopefully go to us being able to eliminate and shut down that. <coughs> you, can you quickly just go through, some of the money is going to street cleaning and some of the other things for the purposes of, of the folks here too, Mark? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let Noel <laughs> go, go through those. I knew you would ask that, but I didn't bring the list with me. So I'm gonna let Noel try to go through some of that. I'll spend it for you. <laughs> no, we, we won't have a problem. No, no, we definitely have a budget. <laughs> Sorry, we're about to pull it up right now. So we we have also provided it's in the back. Councilman Scuola and I pulled together some of the other investments. I know that we have, for, particularly for long-term residents, residents, it feels like we the air has all been sucked out around the opioid. But that does not mean that the councilman and I don't continue to work on other structural investments, and I want to list some of them while we get the rest of this budget. There is a multi-million dollar um, infrastructure investment along Kensington Avenue. We will be putting fiber optics, LED lighting, and cameras from the Frankfurt Transportation Center all the way to Spring Garden. That is not nothing new. It is not for the new people. We've been working on this for four years. There's nobody more frustrated than, than it's, us. It's, it's about gonna start this. with then the next, the lighting phase is the first phase, the camera phase is phase two. Phase one is starting in the next two weeks, starting at K&A. Just got that commitment from the Deputy Streets Commission today. So, and then phase two, we're planning, working with SEPTA to sort of plan the cameras and where they should go. The cameras and also, we, so that project will be completed as part of this. Uh, as you can see, we have a massive cleanup trash plan that we've been working on again for years, and we're working with Impact Services, who runs the Kensington Carter. You'll see many of the trash cans that are out there. We have a whole identity um, campaign that um, that is being funded by by uh, our our Department of Commerce. Uh, many of the rec, rec centers in and around the Kensington Corridor have been projected and have seen investments. And I just want to list them again because folks say, you know, some of this isn't happening. We, we invested 400000 at Hizzy Playground, $1 million at Collazo Playground, $1.4 at Waterloo, $50,000 at Hope Park for lighting. 
Uh, 700,000 in lighting here at McPherson. McPherson Library is also one of the first rebuild projects. That's going to be multi-million dollar uh, project that we're working. We opened up a PAL center in the 25th Police District. Haggard Playground, Heisman Playground, Harrogate Park are all receiving direct funding from Councilman Squilla. Rivera in Fairhill is getting, uh, we're under construction and that's multi-million. There will be a beginning planning grant for McVeigh uh, Playground. I mentioned the Kensington and Allegheny. We have a housing preservation pilot. We're working with Esperanza Health on the $20 million investment at Kensington and Allegheny. And we've been working with SEPTA. They've been part of the partners here to add additional cleaning around their transportation centers. All of this was happening pre all of this stuff. You know, I know we feel like we get sucked up into all of this stuff, but both Councilman Squilla and I understand and appreciate the value of Kensington and the transportation centers and what it, it could mean for the neighborhoods. Um, we are very uh, pleased that the administration understands that these were urgent for us when we put them up. They're even more urgent now because we want long-term residents in Kensington to feel that they are just as important and we understand it. Going back to, and I'll, I'll let Tumar quickly talk, this morning we launched one of the Safe Carter initiatives at Elkins, but Conwell School is one of the schools that has been impacted. We have asked the school district and there is an entire busing program for the students at Conwell, um, who, Conwell is a citywide uh, special at mid school and we have, been, have had many incidents there. Uh, so the school district is on board and also making investments so that we can keep the children safe to school and so that we can continue the after school uh, programming uh, that uh, Commissioner Figueroa uh, uh, spoke to. And now Tumar, what are some of the additional, so trash is a major issue. We're asking those of you who are in the crowd, who are doing feeding and all of that, we really, really are pleading with you to register with the city and so that we can better coordinate this. When folks come from the suburbs, wherever they come and they think they're helping us, if we don't pick up that trash afterwards, to live with it and so we are willing the city is willing project resilience is willing to help you set up trash bags all the coordination so that when you come and you leave you remember that there are residents who live there who are going to stay behind with all of that and so we're really really begging and pleading um, for people's cooperation so Mark, you want to end up I was just gonna say something councilwoman um, for those individuals who want to do a community <coughs> block cleanup or anything like that can contact clip through 311 um, and we can coordinate that so we provide the brooms the rakes um, the bags and then we coordinate with you um, for the pickup after it's done Thank you. Some of the some of the increased funding is going to safe corridor cleanup campaign led by Clip, fencing of vacant lots. Uh, some money going to equipment for the safe corridors to school campaign. Uh, there's a significant amount of money going to the newly funded, newly formed police assisted diversion program that we plan to come back out to the community and talk specifically more about. Uh, right now, it's operating in, in the East Division, in parts of the East Division. We want to expand that to the entire East Division and also make it 24 hours a day. Um, some more money is going to the Salvation Army to help them with their New Day program, which is a program that helps us identify and get supports for victim and human trafficking. Uh, there's a significant amount of money going to the Merrill Arts program to do a Kensington and Lehigh tunnel makeover. Uh, the Department of Parks and Rec is hiring additional seasonal maintenance employees for more increased syringe cleaning in and around in parks. Uh, the health department, we, I think some of you all may have seen in the community some of the big red mailboxes, which is our new needle boxes. We plan to put more of those out. They don't use them. Actually, they do. Actually, we've been... They, they do, don't they? They do. Um, I, I'm telling you they do. I, I <laughs> you, she might be the other. Um, and we're, we're putting, I talked about we're putting money into a navigation, to stand up a navigation center. We're trying to put more money to increase community outreach workers on the street. I think we have about four to six new teams coming as it relates to that. A lot of these efforts are just all of the efforts we're doing at this problem to try to put more bodies, more more people on the ground, sort of being able to service and being able to alleviate some of the issues that we've been hearing in the community groups and through the residents. And also just thank City Council once again for helping us sort of get that. Uh, unanticipated funding so we can do some of these items. Thank you. Um, I'm going to quickly have um, 
Reagan from Net, which is our 24-hour drop-in center, um, speak to that. And then I'm going to use the the prerogative as the chair to allow some of our community residents. I'm not going to be able to honor anybody who just registered today. We're going to go through the people who pre-registered for this evening. Reagan. Thank you very much. Um, I am literally going to convince my colleagues to, oh, I'm sorry, Regan Kelly, uh, CEO and President of Northeast Treatment Centers, or the NET, as people often refer to us. I am only going to make two points. I'm going to condense everything so that the residents can really have more time. Um, one is that I just want to say that NET has always embraced the importance of working with the people we serve and looking at things through sort of like the shoes that they walk in. <laughs> so we have historically hired people who have gone through our treatment program and who are living in recovery. And you have to excuse me. And we have found that it is invaluable that they are the people who need to be involved in the outreach <laughs> to really try to motivate and engage, particularly the people at the encampments, to come in and seek treatment. So we have sent our peer team, peer specialists, again, people who have gone through our program, who have reached a life of living successfully in recovery, to talk to the people who now need to make a choice to come in and choose recovery. And the lesson learned from all of that, quite frankly, is that recovery is absolutely possible. And nobody conveys that message better than somebody who's living in recovery. So as you're all thinking about <coughs> outreach teams and engagement and trying to convince people to come in and seek treatment, <clears throat> that's a really invaluable group of people to tap into. The second thing I wanna say is that NET opened their 24 hour, seven day a week access program in about May or June. Actually, I think we opened in April, but we had full licensing to do all of the medication assisted treatment by June. And I bought bracelets <laughs> because I would encourage people as they're doing the outreach to really leave the bracelets with people. We designed it specifically so that it has a phone number and so that as you're talking to people, if they're not ready at that moment, perhaps someday, the next day, two, three days down the line, they'll become ready because the trick of the Access Center is that people need to get treatment the moment they're ready. And that has been the biggest challenge, I think, of the treatment system and all of the changes that Commissioner Jones referenced are really moving in that direction. So this is a critical kind of resource to uh, be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no appointment is necessary. We are fully staffed with behavioral health assistants, nurses, um, and peer specialists, again, to really have peers engage people, people in recovery, <laughs> engage people who are seeking recovery. Uh, and they'll get a full assessment. We've seen about 1,600 people have walked through the door since we opened. Um, about just under 1,200 have been fully assessed and referred to various levels of care, various treatment programs. The remaining people have been referred out sort of earlier in the process because if they have an obvious psychiatric need or even an obvious physical health care need, we won't complete the process. What we'll do is get them for physical health care, quite often, it's an emergency, and we'll get them to an emergency room so that they can have that need addressed first, but then we'll work with that person and the emergency room staff to bring them back when they're ready to, to access treatment. Um, the, the, I think the biggest part about it that, that is critical to the current crisis is that people can get access to medication-assisted treatment the same day. So the doctor has to come in and you know, do the final stage of the assessment and they can prescribe buprenorphine on site, we can administer it on site, and people can begin that induction process the same day that they come in. And again, it's kind of consistent with the, the, the notion that people need access the moment that they're ready. Um, pardon me? <laughs> um, so those are the only two points I really wanted to emphasize in, in the interest of streamlining. I will leave the bracelets in the back. Please, you know, <laughs> bring them to the encampment. So bring it, the street. you know I've contacted you when people mm -hmm. say that they come to NET and they haven't had access. Is there a phone number we can call? Sometimes people, are, as we're doing intervention in the street, is this the number people There is call? a phone number on here to So get if someone tries to interface at NET, faces some dilemma, that's mm -hmm. the number that they call. And yes. I think this is really important because I know that 
the system is working really hard at opening, being open and being accessible. And sometimes I get calls, other people get called. Somebody went to EDT, they couldn't get service. Please call and get the information. Right. right. And, and personally, because uh, we just recently shared a story that I, I was disappointed and surprised to hear. Uh, I'm going to go and give my phone number out, 215-408-4943. That's my direct access line. If there is a problem, I would never sit here and say that, you know, 100% of the staff we, we hire are flawless, but what I do know is that the vast majority of them are deeply committed, work very hard, and that if there's a problem, we will fix it. Um, the other thing we've done is that our other sites, we've added doctor hours um, five days a week at this point. We're working on weekends. We're working to address also weekends uh, so that we've adopted this open access model even at our other medication assisted treatment sites. So people can get same day access to uh, what we call dosing <laughs> um, at our other sites, one of which is up in the Holmesburg section and one of which is at Bridge and Harbison. So all of those addresses are on our website. Um, and of course our fifth and spring garden site is where this is located as well as a more traditional medication assisted clinic. You don't have to come in through a crisis. You can also come in through you know, planned method or walk in through the open access model at our fifth and location site. Any questions? Thank you so very much. Thank you. She is here and available if anybody wants to have any questions of, of, around NET, uh, around NET. Um, thank you so very much. I'm going to ask quickly, because I, I forgot I had Cheryl also, Dr. Pope from APM. Quickly, if you, again, and I apologize, I do want to get to the residents, um, providers. You guys have forums, my residents. Thank you for your patience and your cooperation. As soon as Cheryl, I'm going to take my prerogative and allow you. Uh, good evening, Council Councilwoman, you guys have left already, Councilman Marcus Miller and others in the members of the council. Um, thank you so much for you. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much for letting me um, provide this testimony to you today in response to the impact of the opioid epidemic in the city of Philadelphia. I am going to keep my comments short because it's important that residents get to speak. My name is uh, Dr. Cheryl Pope and I am the Vice President of Health Services at APM. I am a, on behalf of, behalf of APM, President and CEO, Nolda Ruiz, who couldn't be here due to a private, um, prior, a prior engagement. Um, so, um, APM has been in the Eastern North Philadelphia community for over 45 years. Um, we offer childcare services, pre-K Head Start, we have four mental health outpatient clinics, we have drug and alcohol outpatient clinics. We have supportive housing services, resource home certification with over 350 foster care homes, adoption services. We have designed and constructed over 300 affordable homes and a financial opportunity center. We also facilitated a Hurricane Maria resource program helping individuals to access housing and other social services here in Philadelphia. We are a multicultural, multilingual agency that serves individuals throughout the greater Philadelphia area. A complete listing of our services appears at the end of this testimony. And you can also find out more about our agency at www.apmphila.org. Um, in this testimony, I wanted to provide responses to what we have seen, what we have done with the city, how we see our efforts working, and our recommendations for the city. Uh, again, I'm going to keep it really short. Um, the opioid um, epidemic is really um, multifolded. What we see in our clinics are persons who present with um, addictions to benzos as well as addiction to opioid. We also see individuals presenting with um, who have been over prescribed opioids in response to pain um, versus providing physical therapy by doctors. Um, much of which is resulting in the over prescribing of Indoset and other opioid and um, Oxycontin medications. Um, we are also seeing anxiety and major depressive disorder as the common, uh, most common diagnosis and um, commonly prescribed benzodiazepines. Members come in and they have canned messages around their symptomology so that they can receive these certain types of prescriptions. Um, we were working directly with CBH and OMSAS to address a need that resulted from a particular um, clinic being closed, a particular agency closing. There were four clinics and there were over 5,000 patients being seen. 
Um, we presented to CBH our um, proposal packet along with others and we were awarded the opportunity to maintain mental health homes for these individuals. For us, it was important that they maintain their mental health homes. Um, if not, these individuals, as I said, 5,000 would have been lost to care. We don't want to see that happen. So over the past the 90 days, starting from April, we um, stood up four clinics. And there were, as I said, 5,000 plus members who needed treatment. And over the first 90 days, we were able to ensure that no one got lost to care. No one lost their medication or any of that. Um, and over the last seven months, four months, we have been reassessing individuals to determine if they really needed care, if our level of care was most appropriate. We provide IOP, OP, and Suboxone services to members as well. But this population, um, you know, in the, in the field, it has been said that meet members where they are, meet patients where they are, meet people where they are. Right now, these people are in the streets. We are restricted to providing services within the walls of our clinics. Our contract requires that we provide services in the clinic, but how do you get people into the clinic if we can't get out into the community? So, you know, our agency has been around in this community for a long period, a very long period of time, and we need to be out there in the streets with our members, with our community who need services, and our current contract doesn't allow us to do that. All of the efforts of the city and the other agencies involved in this effort are great. They're wonderful opportunities, but as a COA, um, as with COAs, we right size um, child protective services to be in the community. What about right sizing the small agencies such as APM to be available to go out and bring members in for treatment? You know, to say that um, we make our numbers available, to say that we have our services avail available, there is such, something called a moment of sanity. In that moment of sanity, you have to be there. You have to be there to make that help persons to make that transition. A story recently happened. We also um, manage um, supportive housing services for individuals who are of low income. And one of the property managers called me because there was a person outside in the backyard of a resident using. The property manager went out to ask the person if they could help them in some way. The person said they wanted treatment. He called me to see what to do. I felt really in despair, a hopeless, hopeless myself because I couldn't go get them. I don't have the I don't have the the structure, the fiscal structure to send my therapist out to get that person. So giving them the phone number and the address and all that great stuff was wonderful. But by the time the property manager got back to that person, they were gone. So that moment of sanity is completely lost. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So I'm going to take executive privilege. I'm going to allow Jeff to and then we have written testimony for Sterling Johnson and Dr. David Gurick. So I'd like to get, I don't know if they're still here, Rosalinda, um, Elijah, Ramon, we have your written testimony, and Adrian Rivera. So go ahead, Dr. Donna. Thank you. Rosalinda, you wrote the I don't think I need the mic because I have quite no, a loud voice. Please do it. It's an Oh, I need the mic? Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry, people. Uh, I am the ward leader here, and my interest is the people in this community. And I'm glad that you are doing everything that you can for the people that have an opioid addiction. But I think you have failed the community. The reason I feel you failed the community, because you haven't done for our children enough. Our kids cannot go out and play. For Halloween, we had to block the street off and keep the opioid people off the street so we could let our kids trick or treat. The past center had to do a trunk or treat because it was so dangerous. It is not fair to the people in this room who live here and do the right thing, raising their children, and have to watch the opioid people laying all over the sidewalks, using needles defecating on our sidewalks, having sex on our sidewalks. This playground, Maria, you know how hard we fought to get the flyers in here to make the playground. The parents are afraid to let the children come to the playground. They're not, the, the only ones using playgrounds right now are the parents that drive their kids to Stanley for the ice skating or take their kids to the PAL where it's safe with police officers. So when you worry only about the opioid people who made the choice, whether it was 
a, a, a good choice or a bad choice. They made the choice to use opioids. You do a disservice to every voting person in this room, every taxpayer. I am glad that you were trying to get them off the street. You're worried about moving the encampment. When you move the encampment, the hardest hit area was K&A. And the ones that don't go in are going to come to K&A. And they're still laying at K&A. They try to charge people to get on the yell at 4 o'clock in the morning to go to work. They're laying all over. They're sleeping all over. They're defecating all over. When are you going to help our children? Yes, you were going into the school. But as my great-grandson is here, he doesn't go to school here. He goes to a charter school. We drive him. He has to drive past people, put needles on their neck in other places. He has to drive past people sleeping on the sidewalk. He keeps asking his grandmother and I as we take him to school, why are those people doing that? Why don't they do the right thing? I understand most of them have behavior problems, but they are so far past behavior problems now, they are nothing but addicts. There are some that you're going to save, but the ones that you don't save, do you intend to leave them here with us? You tell me you can't move them. When I was a kid, quarter lounging you could get moved for. Obstruction of the highway. Kids walk in the street. Some kid's going to get hurt. Some kid's going to get hit by a car, and then the city's going to be sued. So, council, I commend you for the money you're sending them. You people, I commend you. But you're going to have to figure out a way to make those people move because they just can't stay here. It's not fair to us. We've been the hardest hit. Councilwoman's been fighting and fighting. You, want, you got the two respite center, you take them in at eight o'clock and put them back out at eight in the morning. All they do is sleep all over and take more drugs. You're not gonna help them if you leave them out to take drugs. I don't mean to beat you up, but we're getting beat up. I cannot let that child go out and play. That's why he's sitting here with me. It's not safe. And the only reason he's going out there is because his grandfather stand at, his great grandfather stand at the top of the steps. But you just gotta figure out, and you've had over a year, so why you don't have enough beds to put him in? Shame on you. Shame on you. Because this has been going on for over a year. So if you think these council people are frustrated, you should feel how these people feel who are afraid their kids are gonna get syphilis or are gonna get AIDS or get hepatitis. That's why they don't want their kids playing out there because they don't use the needles. My girl picked up 60 needles here the other day. I'm a diabetic, I control my needles. But you've got to figure out something before one of these kids really, really get hurt. And that's who I'm responsible for. Maria, you know that. My job is to take care of the people in the community and get them to come out and vote. You think they want to come out and vote when, and this is what they've got to live with? There's a lady that feeds them every Saturday and Sunday in the trash. G Street is a crying shame. I thought it was getting clean Saturday, but it didn't. But there is trash from, Alley, from Kensington Avenue all the way up to Sheridan School. You've got people sleeping in the schoolyards. Ride around and see what's really going on. When you go out there, they're sleeping all over Diamond Dolls and all over. My Hoagies Plus has to chase four of them off the step to open her store in the morning. We need help. You're helping the opioid people. I understand that. But you really aren't helping us, and you aren't helping the police. You got to do with them. Thank you, Donna. Um, Thank you, Maria. Thank you, I don't know if you want to let um, Elijah. Yeah, he can. Uh, thank you for letting say, your, me. say your name for the record. Uh, my name is Elijah Desmore, and thank you for letting me, uh, allowing me to come up here and talk. I came here to talk. I came here to talk on behalf of the children who go through random stuff and are exposed to what happens outside there. I basically, me and my brother were making a movie just to show about how our new generation, like me and children, are being treated with being exposed to the drugs, the people just laying, sleeping there, just, and when we were filming, we were walking through the encampments, and even when my dad was right next to me, I still felt scared, 
my legs were shaking and I still had to walk through that. And I was just amazed because I still saw kids coming out of school and they had to walk through there and their faces were just frightened and scared. I could see it and I did not like it one bit. And I just really like, I felt like it was the wrong thing. But not just that, like, I know it happens in more places. So I go to visitation BVM Catholic school and right across the street, there's a tunnel. And when I'm coming to school in the car, I see kids walking. And when they're walking, they're looking across the street. And, I, and then there's a water ice store. And thinking about the kid, kids who want to go out and get water ice, but then there's those people across the street doing drugs and doing just this. Just It shocks me a lot. And I don't think that's right. While well, some of us are here getting rides to school, the others are walking alone seven years old with holding their little sisters, no parents by their side, not having a mom or a father or anybody to look after them while they're walking by themselves to school, possibly gonna get hurt, step on a needle or anything like that, and yet nobody will care for them or aid for them, and I just feel like that is terrible. So I just felt like it was right to come here and talk about it. So basically, what I want is that, what I'm saying is that I feel like the children should be safer and that the adults who do this should realize that the responsibility that they were given and how they should handle it. Yeah. Thank you, Elijah. Thank you. Uh, sharing, we have some of the raw footage of Elijah and his brother filming the encampment story, um, and we'll make it available to folks as, as it progresses. Rosalinda? Hi, thank you for allowing me to testify tonight. Um, my name is Rosalind Lopez, and I've lived here for 30 years already. And we've always had a, a problem with addicts of, in this neighborhood. And only with the cleaning of Gurney Street has it gotten worse. With um, all these addicts around the corner, and I will call them addicts because that's what they are. They make a choice to live out in the street. And um, one of the pet peeves that I have with this resilience is the people who come out to Potter and Allegheny or Kensington and Allegheny to feed them, they give them trash bags so that the addicts can clean that clean up after themselves. There are five trash bins on, on each corner of Kensington and Allegheny. They don't get used, so if they don't use the trash bins, they're not gonna use the trash bags. They use the trash bags for whatever they want to use it. Um, they might put a few trash, but the rest of it, it ends up in the corner of Potter and, um, and Allegheny or in Shelbourne, that little street across the street. I believe, my thing is that I think these people should be fined for feed, feeding these people out in the street. Because I know that people get fined in Center City when they, they, when they feed the homeless. So if they get fined in Center City, they should be fined everywhere else for feeding these homeless people, these addicts that make a lot of trash. In the last week or so, it has been cleaned to some extent. I've seen clip up and down um, out again. But how long is that going to last? before the trash comes again. That's what I have to say. Thank you, Tom. Um, so I don't know if Adrián Rivera Reyes is still here. I know Ramon is here. Oh, Sterling's here. Okay, Sterling. And I, as I mentioned Sterling, because I'm literally, we're gonna wrap up in a couple of minutes. I do have your written testimony. Sterling. Uh, my name is Sterling Johnson. I'm from Active Philadelphia. We're part of a coalition of organizations dedicated to expanding harm reduction and uh, stopping the war on drugs. Uh, thank you for providing this space. I will just say my main points here. I understand everyone wants to go home. But basically, we need to recognize that these are our people. These are our people that come from all the parts in our city. We, they are not outsiders. They are our sons, our brothers, our daughters. We need to take care of them. These are our people. Um, 
I mean, I, I think that th there seems there's an idea that these are outsiders, but these are actually the people that are in our homes. Um, first of all, we need to uh, have more housing, we, uh, period. We need more shallow and deep rent subsidies. We need congregate living situations. People need, to, there needs to be flexible funding with all this housing. Basically, this is a housing problem. These are people who are on the street that do not want to be on the street. By providing more emergency respites, uh, whether in Kensington, whether in different sections in, up in the Northeast, down in, in the South, um, in the Councilman School District, uh, people will go in and then they'll be recessed and they will be able to be discharged to housing. Right now, people aren't being discharged to housing. What are we even doing then? They need to be discharged to housing. Secondly, we need to stop the demand for drugs. Uh, we, you know, our advocacy is supporting orders prevention sites. We have the same concerns for public injection. We have the same concerns <coughs> to decrease syringe and trash debris. Um, but we need to stop the cycle. People are not getting out of the cycle. More and more people are being on the street. More and more people are suffering addiction. This, the, the cycle is not ending. And it's not just the CBH or, or the Office of Homeless Services. It's larger institutions. Hot, people are discharged from hospitals. People are evicted from recovery houses. People are taken from prison and put on the street. There's no responsibility made for any of the people. And of course, we support um, uh, Councilman Greenlee and uh, Councilwoman Bass's legislation because they, all these institutions put profits over the people. They follow the money. Always, if it doesn't meet the bottom line, it is not their issue. And that's a problem with every single institution. Um, of course, we were considered with development that will come with this, um, that's going to come. I mean, we support the fact that, you know, creating space for the people that are in this neighborhood. We believe that more city services should be dedicated to the Kensington neighborhood. It is historically a, uh, a Puerto Rican uh, neighborhood uh, for people of Puerto Rican descent. I mean, we noticed that. That is important. We know that that cannot be ignored. The whole point is that more city ser services need to be devoted to this neighborhood, and not just on a temporary basis, as the woman uh, that the, was just that was just up here said. So this is a 30-year problem. That means we need to have committed resources that understand this is a 30-year problem. And when we're talking about what is going on over the city, we're talking that that, that doesn't matter. It matters of what is happening in Kensington, and part of that is the idea of places like Pathways to Housing, places, um, you know, the Office of Homeless Services, and the rental subsidies. What I know as a person that is in housing is that poverty is concentrated in only a, a few neighborhoods. The private landlords do not accept the subsidies. Therefore, this is a neighborhood where there is going to continue to be violence, continue to be poverty, because I can't get a subsidy accepted in Mount Airy. That is what happens. And without taking responsibility for that and holding these people accountable for the, the discrimination that happens, this this labor will continue for uh, and honestly, um, I mean that is that is what we care about. That is what we care about. We care about ending the cycle and creating this uh, a space for across the whole city. People should not just be um, dis discharged to a housing property that's in Frankfurt, w right by uh, where they used to be. That's not going to work. We all know that's not going to work. All right. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Sterling. Thank you for your patience. Good, e good evening, members of City Council. My name is Ramon Cruz, and I'm a long, lifelong community member of the Kensington Fair. I want to start by telling you that I had a good childhood. My mother and father gave me all the love and support a child can ever ask for. They worked very hard to provide me with a great education. I went to St. Peter's Apostle from K kindergarten to eighth grade, then graduated from Roman Catholic High School. Growing up in the Fair Kensington Fairhill section of the city had its challenges. I did not grow up with the aspirations of being a lawyer, doctor, police officer, or fireman. Due to me being picked on in school, I gravitated to the guys in the neighborhood seeking peer acceptance. I started to go against the morals and values my parents instilled in me, and I adopted a street culture. This behavior, which consisted of drug dealing and other illegal activities, brought me numerous incarcerations for the next 30 years. It was during one of, the, one of these incarcerations that I received the news that my father had passed away. I was not able to attend this funeral due to my high bail. My father's death brought feelings of resentment, guilt, anger, and depression. I truly believe that due to my lifestyle, I took my father to his grave. 
My spirit was broken and the capacity to feel was lost. This led to an opiate addiction in prison. And in prison, I experienced per periodic jolts of reality or self-awareness, with my using becoming uncontrollable and antisocial. I came out of prison with a fully active substance use disorder. One aspect of my substance use disorder was the inability to deal with life on life's terms. As I continued to go through a cycle of incarcerations, my world shrank and isolation became my life. I was seeing that substance use disorder was being treated as a crime or a moral deficiency. My spirit was broken, my life skills were reduced to a low level, and found myself sleeping at times on the Gurney Street tracks. The capacity to feel human was lost. This led to several suicide attempts by trying to overdose, but I was saved by this community with Narcan every time. My life-changing moment happened in the courtroom when the judge stated that if I committed another crime, I would spend the rest of my life in jail. It was during this incarceration through treatment that I identified the core of my substance use disorder, which was learning to properly grieve my father's death. Upon my discharge, I decided to go to a recovery house and continue my therapy and my co-occurring issues. I was committed to a new way of life by putting some structure and being open-minded, willing, but most of all, to be honest with myself and others. It was in, re in the recovery house that I was offered employment and the opportunity to give back and find restoration in my life. Through this opportunity, I learned about the trainings and services at the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disabilities, who offered it, offered to people in recovery, and I applied for the Certified Peer Specialist Training which gives a person in recovery the opportunity to use their lived experience by supporting people to attain a better quality of life. In 2016, I graduated from this training with several job offers. I decided to work for the Community Behavioral Health. It was there that I was given the opportunity to build my, my life professionally, financially, and most of all, personally. After 10 months, I moved into a position to a assistant to the special liaison to the deputy commissioner of DBHIDS. In this position, I had the opportunity to share my story in different aspects to spread hope and healing while assisting many of the DBHIDS initiatives. I had the privilege to share my lived experience on a subcommittee for the mayor's opiate epidemic task force. I was recently transferred to work in the planning innovation division as a peer, senior peer initiative specialist. I'm the lead Narcan training facility, as well, as well as being one of the team leaders at the DBHIDS overdose rapid response team during the surge, and have been recently invited to be on the Philadelphia Res Resilience Project Advisory Committee. After many years of substance use and mental health disorders and being part of the problem in the community, I have chosen to be part of bringing solutions to a community that is near and dear to my heart. I volunteer in the city's cleanups and initiatives to help strengthen our neighborhood. I have approached, I have learned to, that to help strengthen a community, we need to not have a nine to five mentality, but a 24 seven approach. Today, I am proud to say that I have 46 months in recovery and working on getting my degree. a father to my children, a brother to my siblings, but most of all, a son to my mother. I can say that all my liabilities of my past have become assets, and I hope by sharing my story with you, I have been able to help you put a face to recovery and destigmatize substance use and mental health disorders. Thank you. Thank you. to it. I'm going to have to um, uh, keep you guys down to three minutes. I want to recognize our police um, department partners, uh, Deputy Commissioner Sullivan and our Inspector Bachmeyer, who are here with us. As many of you heard, there's a lot of challenges around public safety, and we have asked our police department to go way beyond the scope of their duties and what they signed up for, and we appreciate their partnership and their work with us. So thank you very much. I have your Adrian. Adrian. Adrian.
favor y uh, Asteria. And I'm really going to keep you guys for three minutes. Sounds good. We're a half hour behind. 45 minutes behind. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. My name is Adrián Rivera Reyes. I am a Philadelphia resident, a proud Philadelphia and fully Rican Boricua. Um, and, you know, today we've talked about what city council is doing, what they're doing with different community organizations, and how they're working to address this epidemic, this opioid epidemic, which to me is a personal issue, right? This, this is affecting our communities and our families and our neighborhoods. Ramon just gave that wonderful and beautiful testimony. And so, you know, to me this is personal because in the early 2000s, it was my uncle who died of HIV contracted by unsafe usage of needles, right? It was my cousin earlier this year, in January of 2018, that passed away, that overdosed with her husband, leaving two children behind, right? This is real, and this has to be addressed now, and we need bold, progressive motions and legislation to actually get this solved, right? This is not gonna come, this is not easy, and this, we all have to work together. And so I ask city council, as a constituent, as a resident, that we need to do more. We need to do more and we must do more. Again, this is personal. So I stand here today in front of you and I appreciate all the work that you're doing, but it has to be more. It has to be, it has to be. Because we are dying, our community is dying, our people are dying, there's people in the streets, right? This is about compassion, it's about humanity, right? So we need to address that. So I stand here today as a healthcare professional in front of all of you and in front of this beautiful, beautiful community, knowing that all of these things and these personal experiences and these issues, right, have affected my life directly and I know are affecting our community and our people and our lives directly. And so with that, I want to say, you know, all of these things have led me to one very simple conclusion, but very big conclusion. And so I am a prospective candidate for city council at large next year because I want to take part of this issue and I want to help solve this issue. And I look forward to working with all of you in the near future. Thank Welcome you. Welcome to the chaos. <laughs> 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 First of all, you look at me. to me. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> Asteria Vives. You're the last one, Asteria. No pressure, but pressure. I'm sorry. <laughs> Asteria Vives with Home Quarters and Friends, community activists. Um, in working in the streets for many years, I focused on the um, under the bridge before the cleanup with a lot of the homeless, especially that had the addiction of uh, drugs and alcohol. Now, there's a big difference, but it's not because... Um, it's, it's, it's also because, let me put it this way, a lot of people came from Northeast, from New Jersey, from Chester. So the question is, what are we doing about it? Okay, because you can tell if you work in the streets, you know who's new, you know who's been there. And those that live in Philadelphia, when they would come in and they're new, I would send them back home. I would personally take them to the train station to go back home, and I would give them tokens. Couches and chairs that are placed there, they want to give you the impression that it's to help them. No, it's so they can stay there and they don't go back to their neighborhood, which is in Northeast, in Chester, New Jersey. Families have given up. Not all, families have given up. And that is also part of the problem. Videotaping them, exposing them, and then having the audacity to say that they have no shame. You should be ashamed of yourself videotaping them and placing them on social media. Because when they've given me permission in working under the bridge, giving me permission to videotape and photograph, you have never seen me expose that information. One of the things that I wanna say that's really important is, in the shelters there was a program. It was called Fees and Savings, which Lisa Hirsch is well aware of that. When families or people that have an addiction go into this shelters, their fundings, if none of you are aware, 60% of that will go into a net, into a savings which will help them save for a home. 
or for room. 15% will go into fees in the shelter. Then 25% will go to them for allowance. Let it be cigarettes, candy, hoagies. After the end of the fiscal year of 2016, as Lisa Hirsch is well aware because she was a main supporter of stopping this, they stopped this program. And I kid you not, by December 2016, we spoke, me and my partner, Charito Morales, spoke to the inquiry about the drastic change and the need in this change. Such a coincidence when they stopped this fees and savings program we started getting a more abundance of people out in the street. Why? Because when you stop a fees and savings program, what you're doing is you're not giving them hope anymore. You're slapping all the funds that they're receiving from the government on their hands, and now they're going out in the street and spending it all on drugs because they no longer have this program and saving 60% in savings to be able to save for a home or for a room to give them hope. So you're talking about beds and saving beds. Why don't you talk about why you stopped the program? Because you're so busy comparing with what other states do and you can't do that. You can't do that. Because over in Front, Front Street and Lehigh Avenue, Front and um, all of that area, if you know the records, that was the worst area in the United States. Now you stopped the fees and savings program and you don't speak about that. And a lot of people out here and our advocates are unaware of that, but I'm making it known. So I wanna know when is that coming back? Why you stopped it? Because people are addicts that people say because they're actually people, okay? Just like dogs or children. When you send them out in the street, what do you do? Instead of giving them activities, instead of giving them basic life skills, you send them out in the street to what? Then they come back at night to go to sleep. You send them back out in the street to what? Does that make any sense when you're not giving them any activities or even basic life skills, especially when many of them are young people that have the addiction of drugs and alcohol? So this is what I want to say. And then one of the things I've noticed is that a lot of the people in housing that speak about, oh, I don't have enough beds, I can't give you a determination or a deadline, you came here, in your mind, you're set, I'm not giving a date. I'm not giving a date, and that's what you did. You came with that attitude, which is pretty disgusting. Now, what I want to know is, you're not, first of all, in my opinion, you're not compassion. I don't see you out in the street cleaning. I don't see you out in the street community services. You're nine to five, and if you are out there in a community event, you're paid for four hours, you're done, you're packing up in three hours. So you're not really for the community. So if it means that we need to replace people that are not there for the community, then that's what we need to start doing. Uh, but what I wanna know is when is that fees and savings coming back? So I, you have to direct it at me because this is the hearing. And we will get you know why I didn't look at you? Because I didn't want you to think I was directing it at you like I'm blaming you. That's okay. And I appreciate <laughs> that. So here's what I would say because I know there's some confusion with, with cash assistance and other stuff. We will get you some response around cash, state cash assistance and some of that, that money and, and have it respond uh, uh, back to you. So and just I want to share with you, I've had short contracts with shelters so I do not know the program. Okay. And, Thank and, you so and much I'm, for I'm your happy time. To, uh, we're happy to get you an official response um, to, the, to those questions. I want to end by, and I want to thank Councilman Swilla, who's kind of been my partner in crime in all of this, Councilwoman Gim, and the rest of the council who came here. And while we will officially recess, because as I said, this is not the first conversation. Uh, this is actually the third um, on this uh, hearing. We are going to recess today. I will add that we are we are hearing folks from the community. <laughs> that, excuse me, give me a little bit of time. We are hearing the folks in the community. We are trying to vote from, as you heard from some of our, our providers and some of the government, be a little bit more nimble um, about be, trying to meet people where they are. So this additional funding uh, that we have to add beds is so that we can remove the encampment um, that we have, we are committed. I will say this, I just, you know, I wanna be real, real clear. Um, 
We're not going to give 700 beds to clean up Kensington, and Kensington residents cannot wait for us to have 700 beds to clean up Kensington. And so part of our challenge continues to be how, how do we get to a place where we stabilize um, and stop the normalization, uh, normalizing some of this behavior out there. I will tell you that through Project Resilience and some of the work that we're doing, uh, we remain cautiously optimistic. Uh, and we know that the mayor has come down here personally himself and made some commitments. This is all, all hands on deck. Dennis, we do not have time and you did not register. Just one, just Mr. One Havoc. Just one minute. I, no. I'm not going to give it to you. For the record, just for the record. That's no, Thank Mr. You. Have it. Thank you can you. give it to us in writing and we'll put oh, it in the record. Oh, you know I'm going to be in writing all over. You know that. Yep, of course. Um, in case you don't know, Dennis Payne is an active member of Kensington and the leader of Havoc, who causes havoc on social media and keeps us attacked. And for the record straight, we, the residents, the property owner, would like to know what this letter is about to the property owner. It wasn't discussed tonight, and I waited all night to hear it. Okay, and I will I briefly, just for your, for your purposes, um, there was a letter that was sent out with, with no stationery and signature notifying people who had lots or vacant properties that they have to maintain the property maintenance code, which is get a vacant license or have your property clean and sealed to avoid smaller encampments from forming. There was some confusion. There was a new letter that was sent out, the copy that is in your packet for purposes, because there was confusion around um, this information about the property maintenance code so that people who have vacant lots are responsible for them. So that is the notification that if you're a property owner, whether your property is vacant or not, you have to have a license and you have to have it up to code. So that is the letter there. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Ready. Dennis. Thank, Thank you. you. And with that, we conclude this hearing to the call of the chair. Thank you.